commitment, honesty, integrity, and Easter eggs. These are the core values that create the foundation of Umbrella Core. Here at Umbrella, we are committed to researching only the finest Easter eggs, and our top scientists have been working around the clock in order to bring you 30 awesome references found within the DNA of the Resident Evil 3 remake. So, as you settle down to watch this case study, make sure to like it, subscribe to this channel, and together we'll be able to build a better future for all of us. The first two easter eggs we spotted both take place right at the start of the game, in Jill's spectacularly messy apartment, although to see them properly you might need to boost the game's brightness a bit, like we've done here. Ignore all the dirty laundry strewn all over Jill's bedroom and instead walk towards this bookshelf. Down there, second shelf from the bottom on the left hand side, you'll spot a book titled Louisiana. Now, if you didn't already know, Louisiana was the setting for Resident Evil 7, but this inclusion isn't just a lucky coincidence. If you look closely, the lower two thirds of this book is covered in a suspicious black mould, much like the sinister fungus that turns people into the moulded in and around the Baker family compound. Now look, I know some people absolutely love that new book smell, but if I were Jill, I'd keep my nose well away from this nasty novel. Walk past the leftovers of Jill's frankly bizarre pizza and soup dinner combo and you'll spot a blue diary sat atop her chest of drawers. The label on it reads Daily Report, and eagle-eyed Resi fans might just recognise this as a replica of the Mercenaries diary from the original game, Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. In that game, Jill finds this diary on the corpse of a dead mercenary in Zigzag Alley in the uptown area of the map, and it chronicles the Merc's life leading up to and during the outbreak in Raccoon City. Now, if only we could find a diary that chronicles the choices Jill made in order to choose soup as a side dish for her pizza, because that's just weird. What was she doing? Dipping the pizza into the soup or something? Just after Jill meets up with Brad, after she's finally found the exit to her crumbling apartment building, you'll stumble past coffee shop Sigourney. Now, this isn't just the best place in all of Raccoon City to score a latte and a bagel, oh no. It's also a reference to the superb cinematic sci-fi scarefest Alien. And why's that, you may be asking? Well, not only did Alien have Sigourney Weaver in the starring role playing Ellen Ripley, but also the film originally hit cinemas in 1979, the same year that, according to this sign, coffee shop Sigourney first opened its doors. You see, in space, no one believes in coincidence. That's not the only Alien reference in the three make though, as this pair of posters for the fictional Skullstalker movies demonstrate. The poster on the right for Skullstalker on the Red Planet shows what can only be a reference to the Terminator movies, as the Skullstalker itself looks like the spitting image of the T-800's hyper-alloy endoskeleton. It's the left-hand poster for Skullstalker Adrift in Space that we're after though, because this one shows the cybernetic killing machine wearing a spacesuit that clearly resembles the Xenomorph from the Alien franchise. This next reference is a real blink and you'll miss it affair, but it features a fan favourite Capcom character, namely Morrigan from the Darkstalkers series. Slow this cutscene down to a crawl and you'll notice a picture of this Scottish succubus on a bar sign that Brad lobs at the approaching zombies near the start of the game. Stop the footage completely and you'll even be able to spot why she's on there in the first place. For a promotional Halloween cocktail night, that's why. The best thing about this promotion though, aside from the price of the drinks of course, is that each one is named after one of Morrigan's moves from Darkstalkers 3. The four cocktails listed are Darkness Illusion, Cryptic Needle, 
Shadow Blade and Astral Vision, which makes this a very clever easter egg indeed. Anyone who's played the original Resident Evil 3 will remember Dario Rosso, the portly panicker who locks himself inside a container in the warehouse where Jill finds the first save room. What? What do you think you're talking about? I just lost my daughter out there! Even though he's only got a short amount of screen time, his fear-fueled ramblings have made him a classic character, so it's no surprise that he's made a return in the remake, albeit with quite the makeover. I'd rather starve to death in here than be eaten by one of those undead monsters! Now leave me alone! 2020's Dario Rosso may have lost a bit of body mass, but he's gained quite a few years in return, looking at least 20 years older than his previous character model. The coolest thing about this easter egg though is that you can continue to speak to him once he's locked himself in the trailer, and if you keep pestering him enough, he'll repeat some of his lines from the original game. I'm not going anywhere! I'd rather starve to death than here to be eaten by one of those undead monsters! Now leave me alone! Here's another Resi 7 reference for you now, this time in the shape of an awesome automobile. During the fight on top of the parking garage near the start of the game, Jill climbs into this orange car and proceeds to ram Nemesis off the edge of the building. The unique wood-panelled interior of this car makes it easy to recognise as the same car that Ethan drives at the start of Resident Evil 7. I feel the need the need for another easter egg, so we're taking a trip back in time to 1942 with this here movie poster, where we can spot two references for the price of one. Not only is this poster for Air Combat 1942 a complete rip-off of the poster for Tom Cruise's airborne adventure movie Top Gun, but it's also a reference to Capcom's classic vertically scrolling shooter game 1942. In another interesting bit of tie-in trivia, the North American home console port of this famous arcade game was released in 1986, which is the same year that Top Gun first hit the cinemas. I'll tell you what, there aren't half a lot of easter eggs in the subway posters in Resident Evil 3, and while some are easy to spot, others, like this one, can be a bit more obscure. This poster for Wolf of the Battlefield here is a reference to Capcom's Commando series of video games. You see, in Japan, Commando was released under the name Senjo no Akami, which translates to, you guessed it, Wolf of the Battlefield. This name was finally adopted in the West for the third game in the series, Wolf of the Battlefield Commando 3, which came out as a downloadable game for the PS3 and Xbox 360. This poster is another double yoker of an easter egg, as it includes references to both an old Capcom beat-em-up game and a movie. The star of this poster, Command Team's Mars Carlisle, is a dead ringer for Captain Commando, the hero of Capcom's side-scrolling beat-em-up game of the same name. Not only does the Captain Commando sprite have the same red shades as Mars Carlisle here, but in the lore of the game, Captain Commando was also the leader of Commando Team, which sounds pretty damn close to Command Team if you ask me. But if you need even more proof, in the Captain Commando manga, the Cap's civilian name is revealed to be none other than Mars Carlisle. The other reference here is that Mars Carlisle's pose and the title of his movie are blatant homages to the poster for the classic John Hughes movie, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. There seems to be a bit of self-referential ribbing in this next set of posters, as they appear to poke fun at one of the worst games in the Resident Evil series, Resident Evil 6. Resi 6 was hated by the majority of fans due to its huge departure from the game's classic survival horror roots, and some might go as far as to say it was a bad luck game. Others might even call it a disaster, which could be why this poster here shows the main character in a pose that's pretty much identical to Leon's pose in some promo art for Resident Evil 6. Cruel, but fair. Another super quick one here, but if this poster isn't a sly reference to the tyrants from the Resident Evil series, then, well, nothing is. 
Tyrants come in many forms, but most of you will be familiar with Mr. X from the Resi 2 reboot. Nemesis from Resi 3 is also a tyrant, albeit an alternative version, and the xenomorph-like head of this sea beast here strongly resembles the look Nemesis adopts when in its final form. So, anyone up for a spot of foreshadowing? This next poster is a bit of a mixed bag. In fact, it's potentially a mixed bag of M&Ms, because that's what those two little dinos resemble the most. But not everyone is convinced that this is an M&M's Easter egg. Some people believe that these characters are supposed to be Bub and Bob from Bubble Bobble, although that seems unlikely, as that's not a Capcom game. More likely is that it's a very, very sly nod to the Dino Crisis series, or more specifically, Dino Crisis 2, as the tagline here, so tasty they might go extinct, could be referencing DC2's Extinction Points, or EXP, which are awarded to the player for each kill. This next rocking easter egg sounds like an excellent callback to a very specific moment in Resident Evil 3, in which Jill finds a poster for the fictional rock band Big E in the alleyways in the uptown area of Raccoon City. You can find a reimagined version of that poster in the subway station alongside all the other easter eggy posters, and this one also lists the date of the concert as 30th of September, which is pretty unfortunate seeing as the events in Raccoon City kicked off on the 28th. Huh, I wonder if Ticketmaster will be offering refunds. One of the most memorable moments in Resident Evil 3 is when Jill finds these cheesy commercials for Umbrella's pharmaceutical products, so it's no surprise that they're referenced in the remake. This advert for AquaCure is pretty hard to miss, what with the code to one of the game's safes being hidden on it and all the boobies, but there's also another reference that's harder to spot. Look closely at this poster of a mother and her baby in the pharmacy and you'll see that it's advertising Safsprin, another umbrella product that definitely, in no way whatsoever, will turn you or your loved ones into zombies. Although, maybe don't take it, you know, just to be on the Saf side. The Kite Brothers Railway Office is the location of one of the remake's few prominent puzzles, and it's also the site of a great easter egg which references the history of Raccoon City. You see, this isn't the first time the Kite Brothers and their railway realm have been mentioned in a Resident Evil game. In Resident Evil Outbreak File 2, you can collect an old pamphlet that delves into the origins of the Kite Brothers' famous railway, which, according to the text here, opened in Raccoon City in 1969. Nice. There's even an office in Outbreak File 2 that looks suspiciously similar to the one that features the track management puzzle in the Resident Evil 3 remake. Carlos, I'm in the control room. Now what? Nice. Now you gotta plot out a route. This next easter egg is mega, man, but it's also super in your face blatant, so the only way you'd miss it is if you were playing the game with your eyes closed, which isn't advisable because this is a gorgeous looking game. Anyway, I am of course referring to the interior of the colourful Toy Uncle store, where Mega Man figurines line the shelves and posters adorn the walls. There are a few more subtle Mega Man references in the game though, like the pictures of Dr. Light and Dr. Wily on this poster in the subway, or the sign for the Big Wave shop in the main street, which is the name of a shop in the Nintendo DS game Mega Man Star Force 2. On a positive note, it's nice to see Nemesis there observing the current social distancing rules and waiting politely outside the store until I'm done shopping. Maybe he's not such a bad monster after all. Don't leave Toy Uncle just yet though, as there's a special promotion on at the moment. If you spot one easter egg, you get two free. Namely, this poster for Monster Shooter, which is as close to a Monster Hunter reference as they come, and this poster for a card game called Arthur, who is of course the hero of Capcom's Ghosts and Goblins series. Bargain! 
Right, I think we're finally done with posters, so let's move back to signs and shop names, because as we've learnt from Coffee Shop Sigourney, the names of the businesses in Raccoon City also hold their fair share of secrets, starting with this one here from Lone Wolf Cigarettes. This is a super obscure one to anyone who doesn't have a Wikipedia-like knowledge of Resident Evil and its spin-offs, because Lone Wolf is the name of a playable character in Resident Evil Operation Raccoon City. Lone Wolf also goes by the name of Nighthawk, and in Resi lore he was an ace helicopter pilot who served in the same unit as Hunk. Not much else is known about Lone Wolf, but I guess we now know that he's a smoker. Which, to be honest, is fair enough, considering there's a zombie apocalypse going on and all that. If you're going to have a classic Capcom character become the mascot of a pet shop, you're going to want to have one that's named after an animal. Which is why Street Fighter's Eagle lends his name and his image to this Raccoon City pet shop. Eagle first appeared as a non-playable opponent in the original Street Fighter game, but fight fans were finally able to indulge in some fisticuffs with him in Capcom vs SNK2 and Street Fighter Alpha 3, where thankfully he fights with a pair of sticks and not the little budgie that he's holding on the sign. Let's have a little musical interlude now, thanks to this rather tasty easter egg which you can find if you head inside Moon's Donuts. Enter the restaurant and you'll be able to hear a funky rock tune playing over the tinny in-store speakers. Listen really carefully and you'll be able to make out a very funky bass line, which, seasoned Resi fans will know, is part of the ending theme from the Leon B scenario in the original version of Resident Evil 2. Take it away, Leon. Hey, it's up to us to take out Umbrella. <laughs> Now, I'm not sure if this one is a proper easter egg or not, but these video screens that show the location of the four circuit breakers in the generator house sure do look like a reference to the old crap your pants internet screamer, the scary maze game from 2004. If you don't know what I'm referring to, you'll almost certainly have seen the game in action in this viral video. They did so narrow at the bottom. I wonder if that guy was the inspiration for One Punch Man. This is just a little quick one, but it ties in really well to the events in Resident Evil 2, when Leon and Ada met Kendo, the owner of the gun store, and his rapidly zombifying daughter. Chat to Kendo in Resi 3, and then when he leaves, walk over to the door to hear him reassuring his sick kid that she'll be okay. It's alright, Pumpkin. It's alright. That's a good girl. Considering we know the outcome of this situation, thanks to the events in Resi 2, this makes this little easter egg all the more poignant. She was our sweet little angel. OK, these final few easter eggs all crop up in the chapter where you first gain control of Carlos as he explores the RPD building. The first one features in this cutscene, and it's another neat example of how events in the Resident Evil 3 remake tie in with things that we saw in its predecessor. Here we find out that it was actually Stars member Brad who gave poor old Marvin his mortal wound, although that was mainly thanks to Marvin's hesitation to pull the trigger on his friend. Most impressively of all, though, the events shown in this easter egg are what Marvin is referencing in this cutscene from the Resi 2 remake. And don't make my mistake. If you see one of those things, uniform or not, you do not hesitate. You take it out, or you run. Got it? Now, before you head inside the police station, make sure you backtrack a bit and head down these stairs to find a couple of really cool and slightly sad Easter eggs. The first one pays tribute to our dearly departed Brad, the guy that Carlos just killed. Oops, awkward. Sorry, poster boy. 
while the second one, which can be found in the locker on the opposite side of the room to the poster, is Leon Kennedy's police uniform, which he's not been able to put on yet because at this point in the Resident Evil timeline, he's probably still fannying around in that gas station where he first meets Claire. Ever wondered how these unlucky officers that are giving Eva and Zoe a shock here managed to end up in these unfortunate states? There as well. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Oh. That's never happened. I don't. I don't think I've had that happen before. Well, thanks to this scene from the three make, we now know it was a liquor what done it. <laughs> oh, unlucky lads. What the hell was that thing? Carlos isn't afraid of running his mouth a bit, especially when he's trying to chat up Jill. But it turns out he's even a bit of a motor mouth when he's on his own. Thankfully, the things he says are rather entertaining though, as some of them poke fun at some of the stranger things in the Resident Evil universe, like the weird doors in the police station, for instance. Now here's a weird fucking door. Leave it. Another cool line is triggered when you take a look at these decorations for Leon's welcome party. Yeah. Welcome, Leon. Bet you had a kick-ass first day. <laughs> I'll take that bet, Carlos. The majority of Easter eggs in the RPD section do tend to be nods towards events from the last game, but if you head into the dark room at the back of this save room, you'll find a more classic type of Easter egg, one that references another video game series. Well, if cameras killed those things, I'd be set. The series in question here is Fatal Frame, aka Project Zero, which sees the protagonists using something called the Camera Obscura to defend themselves against spooky ghosts. I'm not 100% sure why they included this easter egg, as Fatal Frame wasn't even developed by Capcom, so I guess it must have come down to a snap decision. Get it? Snap? Nah. You absolutely can't miss this next easter egg as it's Carlos's main mission inside the police station and that mission is to blow up the wall in the men's locker room. In Resident Evil 2 the damage has already been done and the big hole in the wall posed a lot of questions. Mainly, how on earth did it get there in the first place? Well, now we know it was Carlos, his lovely big hair and a bloody big bomb. Alrighty, it's been a bloody long road, but we're finally on to the last point in this video, and this one is actually three separate easter eggs in one, and they come in the form of the game's trophies or achievements. The first one, which unlocks when you escape Jill's apartment, is called First Escape, which is a reference to the title of a Chinese language comic tie-in to Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. Next up, there's this trophy called Power Stones, which is of course a reference to Capcom's Power Stone series of games. And last but not least, there is of course a trophy called Master of Unlocking. Because of course there is. There had to be. Here's a lockpick. It might be handy if you, the Master of Unlocking, take it with you. We here at Umbrella hope you've enjoyed this case study of Resident Evil 3's easter eggs. If you have done, we have a fully stocked virtual library full of similar case studies, which you can peruse right here. Don't forget, here at Umbrella, we are working to build a brighter future for us all. So why not join us in our endeavours by subscribing right now? We thank you.